Well, here's Krugman over the weekend. Let's bring up something from Krugman. He decides, uh, David, that we need a primer on austerity. The story of our time, the other side jeered, insisting that interest rates would skyrocket and that austerity would actually lead to economic expansion. Ask bond traders, Sarah Eisen, or the suffering okay. populations of Spain and Portugal, and so on, how it actually turned out. Is austerity failed? Yeah, austerity hasn't been tried. Uh, we have basically been in a fiscal expansion now for the last 20 or 30 years. There's a very minor slowdown right now, but the economy is still enormously dependent on that injection of deficit spending from the Fed. So I don't agree with that at all. Do you, at the margin, do you see austerity, Josh? Sure, absolutely, especially in Europe to an extent here as well. Um, and I don't, I don't understand how you can say we've been on a 30-year fiscal expansion. I mean, in the 90s, we were running a budget surplus. Um, but uh, the, I, I think what we have seen in Europe absolutely is fiscal adjustment. We've seen tax increases. We've seen restraint in the, in the growth rate of spending. And well, we've I, seen I, negative impacts across David, southern Europe. David, has Europe been a good experiment for the United no, States? Do you watch Europe? Yeah, of course I watch it closely. And uh, austerity is not an elective course. You know, it's not like basket weaving in college. You take it because it's fun. <laughs> Austerity happens. Wait, I made you in that. Ease <laughs> okay, up. Ease up. <laughs> Austerity happens when you can't sell your debt, or when your debt you can sell at double-digit rates, or a prohibitive carry cost, and that's where you end up if you don't start preparing for the future. So right now, I guess we can issue 800 billion of debt. Can we do it every year for the next 20 years? That's what we have in the forecast. Well, but if unlike we, Europe, we are not facing an imminent crisis in the bond market. So what would give us the impetus to Well, that's where the austerity? that's where the Fed policy is so bad. It is enabling the government to borrow money as Tom just said at 0.21 But it's not just but, the Fed. We also have the reserve. No, 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 no. I, I'm talking about the interest rate. In other words, when the uh, when Washington can borrow money at 0.21 for two years or five-year money at 0.7, to them it's free. And so they continue to kick the can down the road and say Josh, jump the, in here, please. the deficit is a problem. This is what this we're going to do, folks. Tomorrow. We're going to rip yeah. up the script for the entire hour. We've got Stockman and Barrow. It's <laughs> ugly. No fist fights. It's not the White House dinner. Josh, jump right. in here. It, yeah. It's not just the United States that's borrowing cheaply. It's any country that can print its own money. And it reflects a willingness on the part of investors to make, that, to make those loans cheaply. If they were desperately afraid of high inflation, you would see higher interest rates to compensate for that. But you're not seeing that in the U.S. You're not seeing it in the U.K. You're not seeing it in Sweden, you're not seeing it, and increasingly you're not even seeing it in a lot of okay. the Eurozone. Well, David, I want to look at the US. score right now. Here's yeah. an elegant chart. On radio, folks, it's a real simple gorgiosity chart. It's from 2006, and it's a U.S. GDP. It's a straight line up, a great success, and Italy is flat on its back. I mean, the, you know, we're up 20% in our nominal output in five or six years versus Italy up 4%. We must be doing something right, Mr. Stockman. I would say that is not a good measure of where we are. We were up year over year 1.8%. We were up in the last 13 years average 1.7%. That is a slow rate of growth for GDP, the slowest rate since the Civil War for a 13-year period. Our economy is struggling because it has too much debt on the household sector and because there is total uncertainty about fiscal policy and because what the Fed is doing, setting interest rates at zero, is fundamentally destructive. It's not about inflation of wages or inflation of products. It's about inflation of financial assets. So and the Fed keeps inflating financial assets. We get bubbles, then we get busts, then the economy goes through a dislocation. We get another bubble, we get another bust. We're in the third one right now. That's what's wrong with the interest rate policy. It's not inflation, that's a red herring. Mm -hmm. It's financial asset inflation <clears throat> and turning Wall Street into a gambling den, which is exactly what the Fed has done. Well, basically what you're arguing is that the Fed has sort of gone too far into the realm of fiscal policy. It, it has done that because obviously it has destroyed the savers of America, all right? On a CD, you're making 40 basis points. So the savers of America are transferring three or four hundred billion well, a year the, to the banks okay. to bail out the banks. Josh, help me. You've yeah. written on this beautifully. Yes. This is from the New Testament. The interim yeah. winners from this ordeal <laughs> will be the gangs of crony capitalism and the opulent 1%. Are they the ones winning here? 
No, nobody's winning because we're having a negative sum fiscal policy and to some extent monetary policy because we haven't had enough ease on, on either side. And, and this is what I don't understand about, about your thesis. I, I haven't read the book yet. I read the long uh, essay in, in the New York Times about Please, a, a few weeks ago. <laughs> and it, this is your story not just of the last 10 years but the last 80 years that we made this huge mistake going off the gold standard in the 1930s and we've had this Fed fueling bubbles ever since then. I don't know how you I can look you at You didn't the read the book because obviously I didn't say that. I said in the 50s and 60s. 60s, we had a great Fed chairman. His name was William McChesney Martin. Yeah. He did not believe yeah, in blowing bubbles. He kept the interest rate at 1%. We had no financial crises. We had great economic growth. Then Nixon closed the gold window. He turned Arthur Burns loose to massively gun the money supply. We had the great inflation. And then we needed Volcker to fix it. Dude, so, gonna, please, Josh, know, so jump let's in here. But can we go back to McChesney Martin in the 50s? Is this Pleasantville? It's, is it Pleasantville? Is it, can we go back to Pleasantville? What do you mean? That's a movie in the 50s. Can we go <laughs> yeah. back to the 50s? No, the, I mean, the 1950s were a very odd economic situation where basically we got to rebuild all of Europe uh, with a protected market. And I don't think, you know, the, you, you hear a lot of 50s revisionism from the left where they say, you know, we had, you know, great wage equality and, and economic growth and very high taxes. And I think, you know, appealing to the 1950s from, from any economic perspective is not fruitful because it's such a unique time.